like to start with a little funny story. It makes us all comfortable, or at least me comfortable. So uh, here's my funny story to start with. And many of you have heard this already. Um, when, uh, shortly after I had accepted the position, I, I came for several visits to, just to kind of get to know people here and get things in place. And so um, I was at the airport and renting a car at the Hertz counter and uh, just making small talk with the woman who was getting my car. And she said, oh, so is this business a pleasure? I said, well, it's a little bit of both because I've just taken a position here. She said, oh, what will you be doing? And so I said, I'll be the new director of the Mind Institute. And then I was getting ready to explain what that was. And she goes, girls, girls, come and meet the director of the Mind Institute. <laughs> And so, you know, it was like the only time that I kind of slightly felt like a rock star. Uh, but what, what was really impressive uh, about that is that it turned out that one of the women who worked there had a child on the spectrum who had been diagnosed here. And I think what that really said to me was how well respected the Mind Institute is in this community, but also how much the expectations, are, how high the expectations are for us. We really are the hope for families, and I take that very seriously, and I think it's really uh, an obligation that everyone around here, no matter what your position and what your role feels, and I think that's what really makes this a special place. This has an almost tangible commitment to families at the Mind Institute, and that's why it was not a hard decision to leave Wisconsin after 24 years. This is really a special place. So I feel very fortunate to be here, um, and, but I don't get any deals that hurts rent the cars nonetheless. So. Um, so what I want to talk about today is, is a little bit of personal history and background. Uh, just to kind of let you know my perspective, and, and Robin did a nice job of, of sharing some of that, I want to talk a little bit about the past and present of the Mind Institute, uh, just as a way of kind of bragging on what we do, um, and then give you a sense of my vision for the future. And uh, there really are kind of five themes to my vision. The first is kind of core values. Uh, the second is uh, an expanded concept of translational research. Uh, another concept is clinics without walls, uh, supporting and empowering families and investing in the future. And then we'll talk very briefly about implementing the vision uh, and per perhaps what your role is in that as well. Uh, so in terms of uh, personal history, as Robin mentioned, my PhD is in psychology from the University of Illinois at Chicago. And uh, that was the point at which I really got my first exposure to uh, the study of intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I have to say, when I started graduate school, I was really interested in language development, but not really in language impairments or in individuals with intellectual disabilities. And what happened was I got a job uh, on a project, and it was a really interesting project. It was designed to understand the environmental factors that promote or inhibit the formation of friendships between adults with intellectual disabilities who work in the community. And so um, I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time in sheltered workshops around Chicago, as well as in a variety of residential facilities for individuals with intellectual disabilities. And it was really kind of formative for me, and it's something that I've kind of taken with me to this day, and that it's, um, uh, I really learned that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities weren't defined by that disability. It was only one part of who they were, that they really lived lives that were as complex and dynamic and nuanced as everyone else. Um, I also learned, unfortunately, that uh, in many respects, they lived and worked in absolutely deplorable conditions. And it really said something about the extent to which we as a society support and value individuals with the developmental disabilities. And that really has continued to motivate me uh, since. Um, I then did a postdoc at uh, the Vanderbilt Kennedy Center, which uh, in many respects is a lot like the Mind Institute in terms of the types of programs it has. And one of the things that I took away there uh, was really uh, to, uh, the value of interdisciplinary research. And that's something that I continue to value and, and try to uh, exemplify in my own research. I then moved uh, to Wisconsin in 1987 and was there until just this year. Uh, I had a faculty appointment in the Department of Educational Psychology. And I had uh, an, an appointment as a scientist at the Wasteman Center. And that really was an opportunity for me to develop kind of in two ways and, and learn two things that I think are really important. One was it allowed me to really kind of embody in my own research uh, interdisciplinarity. And so by the time we were uh, we moved from Wisconsin, we had probably three or four projects ongoing in our lab with about 20 to 25 people from multiple disciplines, graduate students, undergraduates, uh, postdocs, and uh, um, professionals, genetic counselors, psychologists, and the like. Uh, and so that really kind of, I kind of grew up in an interdisciplinary environment there. And the other thing is I became involved in, in administration, but I have to say that one thing that, that I liked about the administration is that it, uh, it wasn't uh, so much that I liked the administration for the sake of administration, but I came to appreciate that that was another way to have an impact on the lives of families affected by uh, 
uh, developmental disabilities, because we can really facilitate, if you, if you do administration well, uh, one hopes that you make everyone else's work easy, easier so that they can actually have an impact on people's lives. And so uh, I have to say that kind of all of these things really prepared me to be here, or at least I hope they've prepared me to be here. The time will tell. In terms of my uh, research, um, as Robin mentioned, I really focus on understanding the nature, causes, and consequences of language impairments in people with developmental disabilities. And in the last, oh, 12 to 15 years or so, we've really focused on a language challenges in Fragile X Syndrome, Down Syndrome, and Autism Spectrum Disorders. And um, uh, just as a, a little bit more personal history to kind of give you my perspective, uh, when we started out, we really did research in the schools. And we were interested in language challenges in school-age populations of kids. And what that meant was that we basically went into the schools and we would pull kids from their classrooms and we would do a variety of tests and assessments with them. And I think we did some very good research. But one of the things that was true about that research is that we had no contact with families other than parents signed the consent form and then sent them back and then we tested their kids. And probably in uh, the mid to late 1980s, we for a variety of logistical reasons, that was no longer feasible. We really had to bring kids into the Wasteman Center, into our lab, and that meant that we had to interact with families. And I have to say, it was really a transformative experience for, uh, for me and as well as for everyone else in the lab. We began, I think, to be just amazed at the resilience of families. Uh, we, but we also were really concerned about the stresses that families faced as they tried to deal with all of the challenges that the systems of supports or lack of supports posed for them. And it really has, in many respects, kind of changed the nature of our research. It's also made our research a lot more fun. I think we have a great time. We have relationships with families that we've maintained for more than a decade now. Um, but so we've added a dimension to our research uh, where we've looked at the impact of uh, stress on families. And I promise I'm not going to share a whole lot of graphs tonight. This is going to be a little bit uh, less formal than that. Um, and so, but here's one graph from a study that we did a few years ago. And uh, this is a study that involved uh, mothers of teens and young adults that had either um, uh, autism spectrum disorder, Down syndrome, or Fragile X syndrome. And we had a variety of measures, basically, of psychological well-being uh, on these moms. And one of them was a, a depression screener. It's called the, the Center for Epidemiological Studies Depression Scale. And it's just a, it's really a screening tool. But it's used in a lot of studies, and it correlates with more in-depth clinical sorts of in, uh, uh, interviews. And what we found uh, was alarming to us uh, in many respects. And so the higher your score, the higher the bar, the more symptoms of depression these moms are reporting. And as you can see, um, the scores were highest for moms of kids on the autism spectrum and lowest for, kid, for moms of kids with Down syndrome. And then the, the moms of the children, the young adults and adolescents with Fragile X syndrome were in between. Um, but to put that kind of in more perspective, there's kind of a clinical cutoff of a, six, a score of 16 on this measure suggests that you might have clinical depression or should be evaluated for clinical depression. And a third of the moms of the uh, youth with autism spectrum disorders met that criterion. And about 18% of the moms of kids with fragile X and about 10% of the moms of the kids with Down syndrome. And uh, it turns out that it's more complicated than just that they have a, a child with a special needs. It was related to things like income, the extent to which your child had challenging behaviors was a big determinant of how depressed you were. Um, and if you have multiple children that are on the spectrum or affected with special needs, that would have an impact. But what that really has suggested to us and brought home in, in other studies as well is that a neurodevelopmental disorder, whether it's Down syndrome or Fragile X syndrome or Autism Spectrum Disorder, it does not reside in the child. This is a really a condition that reshapes the family in fundamental ways. And so when we try and assess or treat children, we really need to do that within the context of the family. And I think as a society, we've done a much better job focusing on the child or the individual that carries the diagnosis. And we've done a very poor job of, of really incorporating the family into the process and supporting families in the way that they need to be supported. So a little bit about the past and present of the uh, UC Davis Mind Institute. Uh, and I always feel a little sheepish talking about all of these achievements since many of them predate me, but I'm going to take credit for them nonetheless. So uh, in terms of history, for those of you who don't know, uh, the Mind Institute really was founded um, by the efforts of six families, uh, five of whom had a son on the autism spectrum. 
uh, and the Mind Institute began in a basement, I understand, as a research and assessment clinic in 1998. And this building um, opened only in 2003. So we are a relatively young uh, institute in terms of kind of the network of centers that focus on neurodevelopmental disorders um, and have accomplished, I think, an amazing amount in a very short time. So this is the, the founding vision, and it, I think it's the vision that really uh, continues to focus us today and certainly will continue to focus us during my tenure here. So the Mind Institute is a multidisciplinary uh, collaborative center committed to understanding, treating, curing, and preventing autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders through research, clinical care, and education. And I think that uh, the, what the, the founding families really envisioned was, was if we can bring everyone together that studies the brain and how bra brain development can go wrong, whatever their discipline, from education to uh, epidemiology to, to basic scientists who work on mouse models or, or non-human primate models, we really have a much better set, uh, uh, chance of really uh, arriving at a cure. And I think that, that they were visionary because I think everyone now is really recognizing the value of interdisciplinary research. So just uh, some facts and figures for those of you who are a bit new to us. Uh, about 250 people work in or affiliated with the programs at the Mayan Institute. Uh, that's 45 faculty who come from 17 uh, academic departments on this campus. And so the Mayan Institute really is not just these two buildings, not just this building and the building next door, which is where our wet labs are housed. Our Mayan faculty are distributed th throughout the campus. And so there's more to the Mayan Institute than just th this beautiful uh, campus that we're on. Um, in addition, just so people know, uh, the Mind Institute, we don't really hire any faculty. So faculty come to UC Davis and they affiliate with, with us uh, because they uh, really uh, connect with our mission. And um, I think that that's really unique, but it also means I'm not the boss of anybody. So uh, uh, we also have about 40 graduate students, 40 fellows and postdocs. 20 or so support staff and administrators, and a really amazingly rich and organized volunteer system. Uh, and it would be really difficult to do what we do without our volunteers, and, and I think that makes us unique. Our operating budget from the state of California is about $2.7 million. Um, more facts. Um, Mind in uh, Institute scientists are currently conducting about 65 or so funded research projects. And these uh, really are supported by grants and contracts with a combined annual budget of about $23 million. And so our operating budget from the state only really supports our infrastructure or some of the infrastructure for what we do. It's really our grants and contracts that allow us to do our research and to do our clinical programs. And if just to kind of put that in, in uh, a little more context, uh, whenever you get a grant from an outside agency like the National Institutes of Health, it comes with something called indirect costs, which are really costs that go to the university to help support the infrastructure for research. So our, uh, we're bringing in $33 million annually into the UC Davis campus with, uh, through our grants and contracts. Most of this comes from the National Institutes of Health, and these are competitively awarded, and the competition is fierce, and it's more fierce now than it's ever been before. So, uh, these are not things that are guaranteed. These are really show the creativity and the importance of the science that happens here. So in terms of uh, research, uh, we have been focused on um, those neurodevelopmental disorders. We have a new interest uh, in Down syndrome with my arrival since that's an area that I've had an interest in. Uh, other people here have an interest in and so we probably will see more research in that area as well. Uh, and so just a little bit about some of the, the uh, neurodevelopmental disorders of interest to us, and I won't go through these in any detail since most of you know these well. Um, in terms of autism, we know that the prevalence is, is different now than it was a few years ago. One in 110 children uh, gets a diagnosis of autism, uh, according to the most recent estimates from the Centers for Disease Control. And one of the things that I think is really important, and this is where I think the mind has really excelled in its short history, is really helping us understand that uh, autism is not a unitary thing, that there's a variable expression in terms of uh, severity as well as kind of the nature of the symptoms um, and comorbid conditions, and certainly in terms of the causes as well. And I think that this is really, uh, again, I think the contribution that mind scientists have made to understanding this variability is really unique uh, in the country and probably the world as well. Um, fragile X syndrome is another very active area of research for us. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Fragile X syndrome is the most common cause of inherited intellectual disability. It's caused by muta a mutation in a single gene on the X chromosome. 
Um, and one of the reasons that it's really relevant to the mission of the mind, uh, even though we began as kind of a core mission around autism, is that um, 25 to 50 percent of individuals with fragile X syndrome also meet criteria for autism. So remember, autism is a behavioral diagnosis. It, the diagnosis itself says nothing about the cause. And so in terms of a known cause of autism, this is the, the single uh, most uh, known cause of autism. Numerous comorbidities, um, distinctive fe uh, physical features in males are more likely to be affected and more severely affected than females. Uh, we also uh, have a really exciting program of research on chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, uh, which has gone by a variety of names. Um, this is associated with development delays, uh, a variety of behavioral and psychological comorbidities. And I think one of the things that really drew people's interest to uh, this condition originally was the fact that it was associated with a high risk for schizophrenia later in life. Uh, and our scientists, particularly Tony Simon, who's pictured there, have really also uh, done some amazing work on showing the role, the important role of anxiety in the manifestation of the symptoms uh, in this condition. We also have a program of research uh, largely led by Frank Sharp, who you see there, on Tourette syndrome, uh, which uh, is defined by recurrent and persistent movements or vocalizations, the so-called tics. Uh, again, we see the prevalence rates there. Uh, we know it's genetic, we know it's inherited, but there really is uh, not much else known about the genetics at this point. Uh, there's no diagnostic lot laboratory test. And then ADHD, uh, one of the most common of all childhood behavioral disorders. Uh, three to 15% of school-aged children meet criteria uh, for uh, uh, one form of uh, this condition, and you can see the three types there. Um, and again, a number of uh, common comorbidities or co-occurring conditions, including uh, anxiety, depression, autism. And I think one of the things that's really kind of brings us home uh, of the fact that even though we focus on children, these are lifelong conditions. In the case of ADHD, there are concerns about risky behaviors as, as adults. So there are high rates of uh, automobile accidents, high rates of alcohol abuse and the like uh, related to the condition. And then Down syndrome, a, a new area of interest for us, a uh, leading genetic cause of intellectual disability caused by presence of uh, an extra chromosome and a variety of comorbidities that you list there. And most recently, and somewhat controversially, also a high comorbidity with autism. There's a paper out recently that suggests in young children with Down syndrome, about 18% meet uh, criteria for autism. Uh, which doesn't fit well with kind of the stereotype view we have of individuals with uh, Down syndrome. But I think that, again, uh, that makes it relevant to our mission. So just a, a few recent research findings uh, from my institute scientists uh, that I think are really interesting. I want to focus a little bit on this one and then a few others that I'll just mention more briefly. This was one that was in the news a lot recently. And this was a study that was led by Sally Ozanoff, uh, who's one of our distinguished mind faculty. Uh, and it was published this year in Pediatrics. And it really uh, uh, tried to address a question that parents often ask, and that is, I have a child with autism. There is another child in the family, or we're expecting another child. What is the chance of that child having autism as well? And uh, there were really no good answers uh, up until this study about that. Uh, the previous studies were very small scale. They were sometimes uh, poorly designed in terms of the way in which autism was diagnosed. Uh, and the samples were small and so on. And so the estimates, the best estimates were between 3 and 10% risk. And in, this, in the study that Sally uh, led, uh, this was part of the Baby Siblings Research Consortium, which was funded by Autism Speaks and uh, uh, the NIH. Um, uh, there were a number of improvements, uh, certainly this, it was a very large sample. And so there were 60, 664 high-risk uh, siblings and uh, families and 338 low-risk families. Uh, or siblings, and the way that was defined was the 664 were families that already had a child with autism, and then they followed the next children that were born, and then the low-risk families did not have another child with autism in the family. It was geographically diverse. I believe there were 12 sites around the country, as well as a few international sites, and they really used the expert gold standard assessments to make the diagnosis, and they followed these children forward. So these were before they were diagnosed, these younger children in the families. And so what they found was much higher estimates than previously. So about 18.7% of uh, siblings that were born into these families that already had a child with autism um, ended up with a diagnosis of autism. Um, but that doesn't really tell the whole story. And I think this is where it's even more interesting and there's a lot of additional questions. Uh, much higher recurrence rates in male infants and in multiplex families, so families that had more than one child with autism already. 
So basically what this one shows, if you look at the male, so if you're a male infant born into a family that already has another uh, son or daughter with um, autism, your chances are about 25, 26% of having autism. If you're a male born into a family that has multiple siblings with autism, then the chances, uh, the risk is around 50%, close to 50%. Um, also elevated for females, but not as much. Um, and so this is a really important study for a variety of reasons. I mean, first, it clearly establishes that um, there is a, uh, autism in the family is a significant risk factor for more occurrences of autism in the family. But the implications for practice, I think, are really important, and that is that um, pediatricians and, and those who care for young children really should treat should re be aware of these risk factors. Um, it's as though they should be monitoring these children that are born into these families very closely for signs that they may also be having developmental difficulties. Because the one thing we know about autism is that getting into early intervention, having intensive early intervention really improves outcomes. And so, looking, so waiting just to see what happens is probably not wise for these kids. And so I think that's really important. But again, we don't really understand the specific risk factors. So just a few other findings, and I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but um, the second one down is, is one that also, I think, just came out this week, um, and uh, Judy Vandewater, who you see there, uh, has discovered a gene variant in some mothers of children with autism that seems to lead to high levels of particular maternal antibodies against fetal brain proteins. And so the mother is generating these antibodies that seem to be essentially attacking the uh, fetal brain. And so I think that that obviously is really important because it links not only a gene to some cases of autism, it gives us a potential mechanism. And I think that that's critically important. The next finding is one from uh, the Irva hertz Pachoda and her group, and that also just came out, I think, this week, or maybe it was a few weeks ago. Uh, they found a gene variant that appears to make mothers, some mothers less efficient at metabolizing folate, and so they are at increased risk for having a child with autism. And again, this links a gene with a mechanism, and what's really important about this one is that this is something that we can actually potentially have an impact on through prenatal vitamins uh, and supplements. Um, we also have uh, just the second one down, developed a newborn screening test for fMR1 expansions, which, which cause fragile X syndrome and a variety of associated conditions. And so there are other findings. And so clearly there are a lot of exciting uh, um, discoveries in all programs of research at the Mayan Institute. And again, that's one of the reasons I pinch myself every day. It's a great place to be. So we also are more than research, however. We also have clinical services. And I won't talk too much about these right now because I want to come back to that. But just, this is just to give you a sense of kind of the scope of what we uh, have here. We have an assessment and diagno diagnostic clinic which uh, does largely uh, evaluations to make diagnoses, of, for example, of children with suspected autism uh, diagnoses and then provides some sort of uh, a referral system and information for treatment uh, to other care providers. And so we uh, really are probably the best place to come for an autism diagnosis, I think. Um, we also have a really exciting ADH program for children and adults that involves uh, medication management, diagnosis, as well as parent groups uh, and uh, groups for, uh, the, for children and teens to help them with organizational skills. Um, and then we have a, a, a social skills training program which really works on uh, tr training very important life skills to um, adolescents on the autism spectrum, but it also does more. It also uh, has groups for siblings, so siblings can understand more about the, the condition as well as how to support their siblings on the spectrum, and as well as parents. Um, and then we have a Fragile X Research and Treatment Clinic, which is part of a national network uh, that is really uh, leading the way to develop standard of care for Fragile X syndrome. And so we see about 2,000 patients annually uh, here in the building in these various clinics and probably tw at least twice that many visits. We also engage in education outreach uh, through the Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities that Robin uh, directs, uh, and this is a really important addition to the uh, uh, Mind Institute. Um, uh, the Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, or SED, is really designed to be a collaboration with uh, individuals with developmental disabilities and their families in the community to really increase uh, quality of life and, uh, have, um, uh, and really work on issues of inclusion. Um, and they do a, that through a variety of mechanisms, including research, uh, education, advocacy, um, 
and uh, just res resources that they develop. And here are some of the resources and uh, some of their activities. We have a wonderful educational video series on tw uh, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome. We have had sibling workshops and success at the fine workshops, which really focus on the transition to adulthood for individuals with developmental disabilities. The Mind Summer Institute on Neurodevelopmental Disorders is known all over the country for the, the uh, wonderful information, and there's 400 attendees annually, and probably many thousands benefit from the videotape presentations that we have on our excellent website. So we really have done a lot, and so part of the, the challenge with coming up with a new vision is that, you know, I was tempted to say, well, we'll do more of the same good work that we've been doing, but that probably wasn't enough. And so I want to talk to you about some of the new things that we want to do uh, and some of the themes that I gave you in our outline just a little bit. So I want to start with core values. And these are values that I think really have kind of captured the mind from its beginning, and they're uh, the core values that we'll continue to follow. The first is that autism will remain, the, will remain the central focus of what we do. And I mean that in a couple of respects. I think that we owe that to the families that founded the Mind Institute, and I, and I take that very seriously. But also I think that the, the focus on autism, because autism co-occurs in so many other conditions that have a known etiology, that by kind of keeping this focus on autism, I think we make progress not only on that condition, but on other conditions that are associated with uh, autism as well, like Fragile X syndrome and Down syndrome. And so in, in practical terms, what that means is we will always have a core group of investigators who focuses first and foremost on autism. Um, I think more importantly than that, though, as we think about adding other conditions to our uh, repertoire in terms of what we study, I think autism still has to provide the litmus test. And what I mean by that is what we don't want to become is a building that has lots of separate research programs. We want to be able to have synergies between our programs, and I think that's what's really made the mind successful and distinct. And so I think that what, what the criterion really has to be is that there has to be the potential for synergy and connections between the different conditions that we study. So when we study Fragile X syndrome, we learn about autism. When we study autism, we learn about Fragile X syndrome. And that's how it should be. And I think that's what the founding families envision. And I think that that's really how we can stay focused on our mission and make progress in all of these conditions. Another core value is that cures, treatments, and strategies for prevention will remain a central focus. That's really what we're working toward, and that will continue to be what we're working toward and where we really, and, and really what motivates us. Uh, interdisciplinarity will remain an organizing principle for all institute activity. And so we will invest in basic science and we will invest in behavioral and social science and in everything in between. We will invest in multiple model systems. Uh, we have exciting research on humans, obviously. We also have wonderful non-human primate work going on. Uh, we also have people that work with mouse models. And in fact, we have, starting after the first of the year, we have Dr. Jackie Crowley, who is, has been at the National Institutes of Mental Health for many years and is the leader in developing mouse models of social impairments that can be used to understand mechanisms in autism, but also can be used to understand uh, potential cures in terms of uh, drug treatments. And she will join our faculty after the first of the year. And so we are growing in that area and we're very excited to have her. And then the other thing is expansion. You know, I say one of the, the things that, that you can take uh, two different approaches to hard fiscal times. You can kind of hunker down and hope for the best, or you can be really aggressive and try and grow. And we're going to try and grow. And so all of the things that, we, that we're doing, we are, in fact, going to continue to do and continue to invest in. But I think there are new things that we can do, and we're going to have to get more resources to do that. And I really feel that that's my job. My job is to find resources to do these new things that I'll now share with you. So we're going to expand. So the, the first, uh, the second theme that's going to kind of drive us is this expanded concept of translational research, which Robin mentioned. And so usually the way that people talk about translational research, they use a very medical model for this, and they talk about going from the bench to the bedside. And the idea with the bench to the bedside is we work in the lab, we make a discovery, and then we turn it into a treatment or a cure, okay? And um, so I'd like to expand on that, and I think that's an area where we definitely want to grow. So we want to go from the bench to the bedside to the curbside. Um, and it may not be an elegant analogy, but what I really mean by that is that there's a lot more to getting a cure and to impacting families' lives than just finding a cure. Um, it's much more difficult. And what we really want to do, what, what takes us from the bedside to the curbside is scale up so that you make this available widely. And that's easier said than done, as I'll show you in a, in a minute, okay? So we are going to really work on getting from, dis, from the bench, from discovery to potential cures, and getting those widely available uh, in the community. 
And let me just give you a kind of some uh, examples of why this is, is uh, harder to do than it would seem. Um, every baby uh, has a, is tested for a variety of genetic and metabolic conditions. And so when babies are born and they're still in the hospital, they take a little a pin and stick them on the heel, and then they take these little spots of blood and put them onto a sheet of paper, and you test for a variety of conditions. And it turns out there are lots of things um, that go into making decisions about what we add. And we do continue to add to the things that we test. Um, and some of them have to do with ex ethics and treatability and things like that. But a lot of it has to do with automation and cost. If you find a way of testing for a condition, for screening for a condition, um, but you can't automate it and you can't do it inexpensively under a dollar, it's not going to happen. It will not get added to newborn screening. Okay, so it's not just, I've discovered how to identify this and screen for this. You have to take that next step. You have to go from the bedside to the curbside. And that is, is much easier said than done. Even in the area of behavioral and, ed and educational interventions for school-aged children, let's say on the autism spectrum, um, showing that an inter developing an intervention and showing that it's effective, that it changes behavior in positive ways is one thing. Making it widely available on a pr in a practical way to the community is a whole no uh, other thing. And, and I'll give you an example from our own lab. So we have an intervention that we uh, just uh, tested on eight children on the autism um, spectrum. These were uh, two to six year olds with uh, very little language. And we're still evaluating the data, but it looks like it was a, a very effective intervention. But here's the problem in terms of going from the uh, bedside to the curbside. So th for these eight children, we had four PhDs involved and we would meet weekly. And they came from communicative disorders, special education, and psychology. We had two wonderful graduate students who, in, uh, who were speech language pathologists working in the room at the same time. We had a wonderful IT staff that allowed us to do distance connections to these families. Um, and then we would meet weekly on a regular basis. Uh, we also would meet oftentimes in the hall to discuss these. And so if you think about all of that cost and all of that effort for eight children, do you think that's really gonna work out in the community like that? The answer is no. So the next step is to figure out how to manualize it, what level of training you really need for a staff to implement this, and how you can do it in a way that's cost effective. And so this is like a totally unreadable graph, right? Uh, but this is, it was really interesting, and actually a, a colleague of mine, Don Bailey, uh, is the one that shared this with me. And so this was a, a study that was published in Science in 2008, and what they wanted to try and do was to estimate how long it takes to engage in translational research. And so what they tried to do was for a number of medical interventions, these are only medical interventions, generally drugs, what they wanted to see is could we figure out how long it really took from discovery to something that was widely available. And they also looked to see whether, they were, uh, whether these uh, drugs turned out to be effective or not and all of that. Well, to make a long story short, the way they did it is they basically looked at the first published paper about a, uh, something being pointed to as a potential treatment for a symptom or a condition. And then they looked at a variety of other publications and they looked at when a highly cited article that suggested it was being widely used in humans. Okay, so this is probably actually a conservative estimate of how long translational research takes. So the median, so the point at w that where half of the studies took longer, half of the studies, half of the processes uh, took less, 24 years, okay? In addition, um, let me, and then let me read this to you. So of the 101 very promising claims of new discoveries with clear potential that were made in major basic science journals between 1979 and in 1983, of 101, only five resulted in interventions with, with licensed clinical use by 2003, and only one had extensive clinical use. So this is a long process. This is not a process that always ends positively. Um, in addition, I think, and this is a really important message to all of us that they ended with, as scientists we should convey to our funders and the public the immense difficulty of the scientific discovery process. So going from bench to bedside to curbside is really hard. And so what are we going to do about that? And so there are certainly some implications for the Mind Institute. We have to facilitate the translation from bench to curbside. There is no doubt about that. And one way to do that is to add expertise in what uh, is often called, called implementation science. And two specific things I would like to do is to create an endowed professorship in what we're calling treatment and systems change. So this is someone 
who is a leader in developing not only new treatments, but in scale up and knowing how to get those things so that they're affordable and can be implemented. And we really need that expertise. Once we can get this world-class individual, then we can recruit additional faculty, fellows, and staff. And so we basically need resources in terms of brain power to really help to shrink that time. The other thing is that we have to develop treatments that help families now. In good conscience, I could not look a family in the face and say, come back in 24 years and hopefully we'll be doing better for your child then. So I think we have to look toward long-term for cures and treatments that are gonna solve these issues in terms of some definition of solve, but I think we owe families something now to help, and we need to develop more treatments that help now. And so a couple of things that we're gonna do, and I feel these are really my uh, responsibilities, to help provide seed money to encourage uh, development of new treatments for faculty. So if you can show that you have a new treatment that is promising, then you can go to NIH and get a lot more money to really do it upright. And so even small amounts of money can be leveraged once you have some evidence of a, that a treatment is promising. If you go just with an idea, it's much more difficult to get that funded. We also want to begin to explore partnerships with industry, schools, and others in the community. And I'm going to return to that again in a little bit. And then lastly, I think we really need to rethink how we provide clinical services to the community. So we at The Mind have world-class clinical expertise. We probably have clinical expertise that you couldn't find anywhere else in the world. Uh, we also have limited capacity. And families who have tried to see us know that. And that's just the reality. Okay, there we have a limited number of people, we have a limited number of rooms. It's just, we will never be able to see all the families we would want to see and that need our help. And so there, but what we still want to do is to increase our capacity. We want to see as many families as possible, and there are two ways to do that, I think. The first is that in our clinical operations, we want to be as efficient as possible, and we want to understand our processes enough so that we can say, if we invested a little more resources here, could we really change dramatically the number of families we can see? And over the last couple of years, uh, Bob Hales, who was the interim director, has worked with uh, Robin really closely to really do that on an ongoing basis. And I think that our uh, clinical system now is incredibly efficient, um, but we're still trying to understand, are there investments of resources we can make that can dramatically change our capacity? And we'll continue to do that on an ongoing basis. But even then, I don't think that's gonna be the answer. We'll never be able to see all of the families and provide assistance to all the families we would like to that really need, uh, need us. And so we really have to transform our role in delivering clinical services. And so I would suggest that we need to move beyond current physical, institutional, temporal, fiscal, and conceptual walls. And let me give you some examples of what I mean. We need to really work hard at creating partnerships in the community that allow us to share our expertise in deep and meaningful ways. We can't see all the kids by ourselves. I think we just have to accept that. And so here are some examples of things that we can do. We can consult and train pediatricians in the community in early diagnosis. We can consult with and train school personnel in evidence-based practices. And in fact, we're doing that through the National Professional Development Center on Autism Spectrum Disorders that Sally Rogers leads. Uh, we also have to partner with health care providers to, to offer screenings in the community. And uh, at some point, and this may be a long-term goal, it would be really exciting, I think, to physically locate satellite programs of the mind in the community that are really staffed as partnerships between the Mind Institute and other providers. We also uh, really need to take better advantage of telehealth technology to extend our clinical reach and support our community partnerships. And all we really mean by telehealth technology is the ability to interact with people in real time at a distance. Skype is a great example. That's inexpensive, and there certainly are fancier ways to do that. Um, but I think we really need to explore those possibilities as a way of really creating these partnerships and extending our reach. And here are just, the, again, some examples. We really want to look at, in our own clinics, the use of distance technology in the initial triage and intake process. Can we, do, can we use that to be more efficient? Can we not require families to always come in to see us? Can we make some decisions about how to uh, do evaluations based on using distance technology? Um, we can do consultations with providers in the community at a distance. We can train school staff, primary care physicians, without leaving here by using this distance technology. And, and I think this would be really cool, wouldn't it be great to be able to, after we've diagnosed kids here, check in on them a year later in their own homes to see how they're doing through distance technology? All you need is Skype or something like it and a laptop in the home and here, and you can really do that. 
So other things that I want us to consider uh, as we move forward in terms of this notion of clinics without walls is I really want us to think about a, a chronic care model. What I mean by that is, in many respects, we really focus on initial evaluation and diagnosis. Um, and then we really work very hard to coordinate care and make referrals and provide resources to families. But it would be really, I think, interesting to provide ongoing follow-up and to become the hub that coordinates care for families in the child, throughout the child's entire life. Because as we know, neurodevelopmental disorders are lifelong conditions. And so we may need to begin to think about not just early childhood, not just middle childhood, but the lifespan in our uh, approach to care. Um, and then I think the other thing, and this is an area where I think we're really um, uh, on the verge of doing great things, I think we have to provide innovative treatments. What we don't want to do is provide treatments that families can get elsewhere. We want to do things they can't get elsewhere. We don't want to duplicate what's in the community. And I think that these can be pharmacological treatments, they can be behavioral or educational interventions. And kind of my dream vision of how this would work is it would be great if we could come up with an innovative intervention that we're going to evaluate so it gets funded by the National Institutes of Health and that we make that available to families free of charge because it's funded by someone else because it's a research project. So I would really like us to blur the boundaries between research and clinical practice. And I think we can do that. So the next theme that I want to talk a little bit about is supporting and empowering families. Um, and, and what we need to do in this regard is that we really need to improve our understanding of the factors that make families resilient and improve child outcomes. Because again, I'm amazed at how well families do. Certainly they have challenges, but I think we can learn a lot by not uh, pathologizing families, but understanding what works for families, how they deal with the stress of having a child. Uh, with a neurodevelopmental disorder, how they deal with the stress of having schools that are not particularly supportive or sensitive to their needs and their wishes. Um, and we need to develop interventions that help parents act as agents of change for their children. And there really are two ways that parents can act as agents of change. They can, act, they can be advocates and they can be therapists. We also need to develop programs that support all family members. And the social skills uh, program we have here is a great example of that. It focuses on parents and on siblings as well as uh, individuals on the spectrum. And again, we need to develop programs that really focus on lifelong needs and transitions that families face. Because again, this is not just about the child who has a diagnosis. This is about the whole family. They all go through transitions. They are all dealing with this diagnosis in one way or another uh, throughout their entire lives. And we have to improve our understanding of the role of culture and family functioning. So how will we support and empower families? We will recruit additional faculty who study processes of family adaptation, risk, and resilience. And I think that's an area where we really need to grow. Uh, we will work to provide seed money for innovative approaches to family-based interventions. What I'd like to do is, is just take a minute and give you an example. This is just one example, and this is one that I know well because this is something we're doing right now. There's a great uh, example that's uh, a bit more mature in its thinking that uh, Loya Vismar and Sally Rogers have done that has many of these same features and is in a bit more comprehensive. But this is um, a parent-implemented lang parent language uh, intervention for young children with autism spectrum disorders that we're now extending to, to young children with fragile X syndrome. And I want to tell you a little bit about this because I think this uh, exemplifies a lot of what we've been talking about. It, it's a way of making parents the agents of change. It's funded, so it's, there's no cost to parents. It uses distance technology uh, in addition to face-to-face -face visits. Um, and so I think it, and it also empowers families. Um, so the, the rationale for parent-based interventions is that parents spend the most time with their children, and so they can give the highest doses of an intervention. If you compare what a speech-language clinician is going to be able to do versus a parent, it's not even a contest. Uh, and so it makes good economic sense if we want to really kind of have scale up that parents become the, the therapists, if you will. The other nice thing about these interventions is they, they allow children to generalize their newly learned skills because they're not learning these in a therapy room, they're learning these at home and with families, members that they interact with. Uh, and what we found, and I think this has been really amazing and powerful to me, is that it really enhances parental feelings of competence and control. We were concerned that we, we about putting too much pressure on parents so that they stopped being parents and they were only therapists. But what we've heard from parents anecdotally is that they just feel so much more uh, alive and connected to their children and that they really now are truly the experts 
for their children that no one can do this as well as they do it. No therapist can. And so it's been really very rewarding. And I have to say, I can take no credit for this intervention at all. So Andy McDuffie and Ashley Oaks, who are here. So Andy and Ashley, raise your hands. They're there. So they really do the, have done, designed this intervention and do the real work. Um, and, and when it goes well, I take the credit. When it goes badly, I blame them. So. So let me just tell you a little bit about this intervention because it's really, for me, it's been a, a, an amazing learning experience. Um, and so what we've tried to do in this intervention is really to recreate and, and intensify optimal language inter interactions that occur naturally with typically developing children. And the reason that that has worked for us and the reason we need to do that is one of the things that we found as we started to work with families, uh, and this is something we should have realized before, was that when you have a child with special needs, over time you adapt to that child. And in many respects, you become, you, over time, you move further and further away from a normative interaction. And, uh, and I'll give you two examples. So what we ask families to do when they first come in is play with your child. So they come into the lab, play with your child. And the whole, interaction, the whole intervention is based on playing face to face and having rich language interactions. And almost without exception, what happened every time a mother and child would come in is the child would be here and face this way the parent would be over here and face this way. The, inter the interaction is not really a dyadic interaction the way it needs to be. But it makes sense. This is a child who doesn't like anyone imposing on his activity. And so parents have learned to respond in that way. We also had an instance where we were doing a Skype session with a family at home and said, so bring out all of his favorite toys and then we'll coach you in an interaction. And she said, we don't have any toys. This is a great mom. The reason they had no toys is he wasn't interested in toys. And so, again, the family adapted to the child's special needs. So what we had to do was help the family understand how to incorporate, how to have face-to-face -face interaction, how to incorporate toys into play. And then we could start the rest of the interaction. And so the things that we want families to do is to engage the child in play with objects, make the play dyadic, expand the play, bring other things in to expand the child's interest, infuse the play with rich language, and follow the child's lead, which really just means really focusing on what the child is interested in and talking about that, because that's what the child is most interested in learning. So if you give the child language that goes with his interest, that kind of sets up the optimal conditions for learning. And so there are three kind of delivery methods involved in this intervention. There are face-to-face -face didactic sessions, and so families come in, a mom and child come in once a month for four months. Um, we have a wonderful PowerPoint presentation about these very specific strategies that we want to teach them with great video examples. So we really make it concrete. Um, Andy sits and talks with all the families about this. So it's a wonderful, uh, even though it's kind of formal, it's a wonderful introduction to these very concrete strategies. And then um, mom and child play, and we are in the room coaching them on how to use these strategies with their kids. Um, and then what we do, because we don't think a once in a month interaction intervention is really enough, is we Skype or connect through other means with families through distance technology once a week, every week in between these sessions. And the families love the distance piece of it because it reduces the burden on them for travel. It's nice to be able to do an intervention at home in front of the fireplace in your jammies. And it makes it much more comfortable and it's worked really well. Um, and with very simple technology. So could I, I'll just give you a couple of examples. And so one of the things that we work on is getting a mom and child to, to play face to face. And as you'll see in this very short video clip, sometimes that means mom, ha mom has to do some moving around because the child will try and avoid that. Oh, Trinity gonna, oh, you. Are you stacking? Stack. Stack. Okay, so again, it seems very simple, but again, you know, this is something that you adapt to over time, and, and many of these moms simply did not do that because of the nature of their child's uh, conditions and preferences for interacting with the world. The other thing that's really important is following your child's lead, and again, if you think about it, if the child is egocentric, which children when they're young are, and they assume everything in the world revolves around them. If you're giving them language that goes with what they're focused on, and they can assume it goes with what they're focused on, you've just made their task of figuring out what you're saying much more easy. Uh, and so uh, here's a mom who is doing descriptive talking, which is really just giving the kid lots of language input about what he's doing right at that point of time and what he's interested in. Green, Green. red, blue, Oh no! Okay, hit one. 
child had lots of examples about color multiple times different words for the same action and that was very engaging um, uh, affect that the mom had mom was really excited and kept the kid engaged and excited about what they were doing together so um, I'm not going to show you any data but the data so far look very promising in the sense that we definitely change mom's behavior pretty dramatically um, I think we are beginning to see some signs that we're actually having some impact on the child's communicative development as well. But I think what we really want to look is long term, have we really changed the, traje the trajectory of communicative development in these kids? But I think that it holds a lot of potential because again it embodies a lot of what we want to do. So the next and final theme uh, is investing in the future. So as I hope I've convinced you and, and maybe depressed you about was that the, the translational research process is very long. And so uh, cures for autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders may simply require the work of multiple generations of science, scientists. And so I think we have an obligation not only to do the best science we can and the best clinical care that we can, I think that we have an obligation as we become more senior that we have to recruit, mentor, and sustain the next generation of scientists. I think I will have been a successful director if when I leave they don't even know I'm gone that there are many better people to take my place. And I think that that's what we really need to strive for. And so, uh, unfortunately, the next generation of scientists is at risk. And I can, just to make this concrete for you, when I, in the mid-1980s, when I really started to get my first funding from NIH, they were funding about the top 25 to 28% of all applications. Right now, they're funding about the top 10 to 12% of all applications. And so for people like me that are fortunate enough to have multiple grants at the same time, if one grant goes away, you still have time to kind of get things up and going. If you're a new person starting out, it is incredibly difficult to sustain a career and to stay motivated given how competitive it is now. And I think we really are at risk of losing some of our best and brightest scientists in every area, but certainly in neurodevelopmental disorders as well. And so at the Mind Institute, we are going to work to create mentoring committees in conjunction with departments. Because remember, all the faculty have appointments elsewhere, so we are only part of their life. But we're going to try and coordinate mentoring with departments to really help them succeed. Uh, in addition, I think it's really uh, an obligation that I have to find seed money for pilot projects for our early career faculty so that they can find promising results and then use that to get bigger funding from the NIH and other agencies. And there may be times where our, our early career faculty don't have funding and I think rather than let them just fade away, I think it's really an obligation that I have and that we all have to find bridge funding to kind of help them through those gaps. And I think if we don't do those things, I think we're really going to look back and find out that we are aging out of our entire field. And I think that would be just uh, a shame and it would be dreadful for families. So implementing the vision. Um, so how will we at the Mind Institute advance the vision? I've given you some sense uh, by some of the specific things we want to do, like have an endowed professorship, professorship and treatment systems change. But I think we also want to look to become part of national networks that provide infrastructure resources. And if you add, and I won't go into any details, but if you are interested, you can certainly ask me a question about what those national networks are. Um, I think we have to reach out to potential partners in the community. I think, you know, as we talk about moving from the bench to the bedside to the curbside, we need partnerships with uh, schools, we need partnerships with uh, pharmaceutical companies, we need partnerships with the business community, otherwise this is not going to be successful. And so this is not really about an, an old-time academic model anymore. We really need to think more creatively and be more entrepreneurial in our approach, not to make money, but to make this work for families. Uh, we will invite input from all of our constituencies. I think it is incredibly important that we recognize that we work on behalf of families. And so families have to have input to this process. And so we will always listen to families because you are why we exist. You are why we have jobs. And I think we owe it to you to listen. We also need to listen to all of those people that we want to have as partners. If we go to them and say, 
we want you to do this for us, that's not gonna work. We need to listen to people and know what partnerships will advance everyone's mission, and I think that that's really critical. Uh, we will intensify our efforts in the philanthropic arena, and the reason that's so critical is it allows us to be nimble. It allows us to put money where we need it right at that moment. If there's an interesting scientific discovery, we can put some money into it, do a little additional work, and then leverage more funding from NIH or other sources. Um, if we have a junior faculty member that has just hit hard times and doesn't have funding but is incredibly promising, if we can just take and put some money into, into that person, that investment can pay off many times over. And so we really need to work uh, in terms of raising uh, money so that we can use it in, in flexible and fundamental ways that I think will kind of keep us moving forward. So, how can you help advance the vision? Well, obviously it depends on who you are and what your role is, uh, but here are some of the things that we really need from partners in the community. From families, we need families to participate in our research, and the participation rates here are just amazing, and I think it really says so much about the commitment of every single person in this building that families come back over and over again. And we have a thank you party each year, which uh, is a way a small way to thank families and we get over a thousand people that come and, and uh, participate in the thank you party. Uh, you need to help us create partnerships in the community. Okay, so we, again, we can't do this alone. This is really about listening to you who work in the community, whether you're a leader in education or business or you're a family member. You need to help us make those partnerships. Uh, you have to provide input to our vision and our plan for implementation. I don't have all the answers. None of us have all the answers, but we have to figure this out together. And so you should always feel free to call, email, stop by. My door is open. We all want to hear from you, okay? Because again, this is, this is a resource for the community broadly defined. And I wouldn't be a good director if I didn't say make a donation. <laughs> Um, and, I, and again, I think the philanthropic uh, um, aspect of our lives is really critical now uh, because we really need to be able to be flexible and many sources of funding are not flexible and so we really depend and are appreciative of donations large and small. So thank you very much. I really appreciate your attention. <laughs> Dr. Abdullah, that was a really nice uh, summary of everything that's going on here. And, and uh, one thing I just wanted to just sort of say, I was really impressed and excited by your sort of focus on, on families as well. So that's something that I've added to our research with families with 22Q lesion syndrome over the last year. And it's exactly what we see is that, uh, to put it in perspective, we had a, a, a mom come in and she's got an eight-year-old with serious uh, health issues and behavioral issues and social emotional developmental issues. And she was telling me about this while I was trying to recruit her for a stress study that I'm doing. And, uh, and after she sort of told the story about how difficult the situation was, I said, wow, well, that's pretty heavy duty. You know, how are you doing? And she just looked at me shocked and just broke down crying and said, no one's ever asked me that. Mm -hmm. Nobody. And it's not that me, not that I had some great insight. It's just, you know, people are so focused on the kids, understandably. They need to be, right. but you forget that the child has a whole ecology, you know. And this gets to the idea too, not just about treating the individual, but treating the society that's around them. Right. So the most of the problems that you tie over and over again, tie look at risk of schizophrenia, risk of major dis disorders, major depressions. So it ties back to socioeconomic status, education, support network, friends, you know. So treating the community is just as important, and by engaging the community in some of the methods that I think you've outlined here with regards to funding and empowering parents, that actually indirectly treats the community. Right. So I think that the, the vision is a really powerful one that, uh, that uh, it's exciting to be part of. Well, thank you very much. I just, I'll add one story about families. So we, we did a study, and it was a very small study, where we were looking at, and this was a different study than the one I showed you, where we were trying to really understand uh, some of the psychological uh, issues that, family, that moms were facing and the stresses that moms were facing. And so many of these were, were moms uh, that were already participating with their children in, in a language study that was focused on the kids. And so then we kind of added this other study on where we were really interested in the moms. And we had, and these were moms of uh, kids with fragile X syndrome. And we had so many moms that get, kind of had the opposite reaction. It was kind of interesting. They would say to us, why are you wasting your time with me? I want you to focus on him. You know, let's really help him. Yet, when we looked at these moms, they had high rates of anxiety disorders, high rates of depression. And so these were moms that were in need, but they had 
been so used to kind of just supporting their kids and having no support for themselves, uh, it was really telling to us. And so we had to kind of help the moms refocus that it's okay to think about you because if you're healthy, if you're doing well, if you're supported, that hasn't, we know everything about uh, uh, development depends on many respects on the parents. And so that will help your child. And so we had to re kind of refocus the family. So it was really interesting. And again, it says a lot to how s strong these families have to be. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, Fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.